Welcome, everybody, to the Ray Shasho Show, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Each week, Ray spotlights in-depth interviews with legendary and up-and-coming authors and music artists. Ray also features the movers and the shakers of the music and publishing industries and suggests important methods for getting the most out of your public relations and marketing needs. Please welcome music journalist, author, and entrepreneur, Ray Shasho. Hello again, everyone. I'm Ray Shasho, broadcasting from BBS Radio 1. And welcome to the show where we spotlight legendary and up-and-coming music artists and authors brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call us today at 941-877-1552 or visit www.publicityworksagency.com. And remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Our very special guest today is legendary British film director, editor, writer, producer, and author Tony Palmer. Tony Palmer's film resume includes over 100 films, ranging from early works with The Beatles, Cream, Jimi Hendrix, Rory Gallagher, and Frank Zappa, to his classical portraits, which include profiles of Maria Callas, uh, Margot Fontaine, John Osborne, uh, Igor Stravinsky, Richard Wagner, Benjamin Britten, and Ralph Vaughn Williams. He is also a stage director of theater and opera. Palmer's latest project is a legendary musical tribute, The Beatles and World War II, issued on CD and DVD by Gonzo Multimedia UK. Uh, Take a group of some of the most famous solo artists of the 70s, like Elton John, Tina Turner, The Four Seasons, The Bee Gees, Peter Gabriel, Brian Ferry, Rod Stewart, Leo Sayer, Keith Moon, Helen Reddy, Jeff Lynne, and Frankie Valli, and get them to sing cover versions of some of the most famous Beatles songs ever written. At a considerable dollop of authentic documentary footage of the Second World War telling the story of that epic encounter. The Beatles and World War II. Sound crazy? It is. But enormously entertaining and occasionally very chilling, a unique blend of music and film like no other. Of that much, we can be absolutely certain. The best collection of Beatles covers in the film ever. In an article written by Ronnie Daniland, editor of Ear Candy magazine, the old 1976 film was the strangest mix of cinema and rock and roll, combining World War II images, including newsreels and Hollywood films made at the time, with the music of the Beatles. Not the Beatles' original recordings, but by various artists. The old movie combined a pastiche of World War II theme film segments, both periods uh, films and post-war action films with the backdrop of the music of the Beatles. Uh, strange concept, huh? Well, a long story, but the end result was disastrous. The original distributor junked the film so completely that no copy survived, and the film took on its iconic status. Says legendary director Tony Palmer of his new film, although the original 1976 film had disappeared thanks to the indifference and stupidity of the original distributor, instinctively I felt the central idea and the uh, material and, of course, the music were just too good to be lost forever. So for those fans who have had to rely on a, a few very poor quality extracts on YouTube, the 2016 film is a completely new experience. And much of it is in HD. Yes, uh, we have used some of the original tracks, but added a lot of new archive footage and some never seen before. In addition, I have often used totally different music. The film starts with Vaughn Williams and ends with Shostakovich taking in Rachmaninoff and Rout and including many of the famous Second World War speeches by uh, Roosevelt, Churchill, Montgomery, Chamberlain, Joe Kennedy, and Hitler. And the film makes reference to war-torn Syria and the massive problems of immigration along the way. It is a far more complex film than the original, and I hope will give everyone pause for thought about the troubled world in which we live. Directed and edited by Tony Palmer. Please welcome legendary British film director Tony Palmer to the Ray Shasho Show. Hello, Tony. Hi, Ray. Well, I mean, you've said it, you've practically said it all. I'm not quite <laughs> sure what I can add. Anyway, you, I'm sure your listeners would be intrigued to know that I'm halfway up a mountain in Switzerland. I'm about five or 6,000 feet up and uh, completely in a tiny little isolated village. 
and the, the thought that I'm speaking to you uh, across the world is, is enormously exciting for me, especially on your show. Well, it's amazing. I guess they have, there must be a, um, well, no, we're not, we're not talking on a cell, are we? Are we talking on a cell? Are you on a cell phone? Well, I mean, we're sending smoke signals from halfway up the mountain, <laughs> which I assume you're, I assume you're reading. <laughs> so what, what, what are you doing on this mountain? Is, it, is this a mountain to climb, or is it a uh, kind no, of no, a... No, no, it's, uh, it's, every mountain is to climb. But no, no, I, I have a little, uh, little farmhouse up here, and I come up here to get away from things from time to time. Um, but it's always a pleasure talking to you, so, I mean, that's the excuse to get back connected to the real world. Well, that's exciting. But your description of the film was so spot on. Uh, I mean, I, I really had very little to do with the original film. Right. I was, uh, I was asked to get involved because the original producers, I mean, we're speaking way back, 1973, 74, um, they, it was their idea to use uh, Beatle covers with Second World War footage. That was not my idea. Um, but they were worried that Lennon or McCartney might object. I mean, not from a copyright point of view, but, you know, they didn't want their music, music used in a kind of um, unsympathetic way. So I was dispatched because I knew them. I was, my job was simply to go and see them, hold their hand and say, this is what they're proposing to do. I think it will be all right. And all McCartney said to me was, are you involved? And I'm afraid I told a bit of a fib. And I said, well, yes. And he said immediately, well, if you're involved, we, we're OK. We, we trust you and you're a safe pair of hands as far as we're concerned. And all Lennon said was, well, I hope they're going to use Give Peace a Chance. Well, <laughs> I said, of course. But in <laughs> fact, they didn't use him Give Peace a Chance. But that was my job. Yep. And then um, they, the two producers said, well, you know, would you like to edit all this material that we're collecting? So I said, well, fine. I mean, that, it does sound very interesting. Um, but unfortunately, at exactly the same time, I'd, I'd been trying for years, uh, to, well, a few years anyway, to get a big series called All You Need Is Love, mm -hmm. a sort of history of American popular music off the ground. But it was, it was huge in scope. That was also Lennon's idea, interestingly enough. And suddenly I got the money. So uh, I thought I can't miss that opportunity. So I had to sort of wave bye bye to the original film. And then, as you, as you quite rightly say, I mean, the, somebody else edited the material together. Um, I, I didn't ever see it until quite recently. Um, but 20th Century Fox, who'd, who'd commissioned it and paid for it, they, that, they didn't understand a word of it. Um, it's not for me to say whether the film was good, bad, or indifferent, but, I mean, they, they hated it. I mean, they hated it mm -hmm. with a vengeance and absolutely junked it and destroyed all the copies. And so it was, it was completely forgotten. And then absolutely by chance, about um, two years ago, I went to, it sounds like I'm so old, two years ago I went to a 90th birthday party and, of a friend, and there was one of the original producers. And I said to him, you know, whatever happened to that film? I never heard anything about it. And he told me the story about it being junk. And I said, well, have you got a copy? And he said, well, you know, because it's pre-digital age, of course. So he hadn't really kept a copy, but he had a very bad VHS. Um, but, I mean, it was falling to bits. That was no use. And so I thought, oh, well, never mind. Put it all down to experience. And then the third coincidence, and this really was a miracle, uh, I was trying to find a copy of another film of mine um, and I, I know that quite a number of my films are in the British National Film Archive. Mm -hmm. So I went online and I was kind of scrolling through the endless dreary films that I had made. And suddenly there was the original film, which was then was called All This in World War II, which right. was a film I hadn't made. But somehow the National Archive had got hold of a copy of it, believing it to be mine. And um, so I begged the National Archive to let me have this copy out. And so I looked at it, and then I, I kind of instinctively realized why 20th Century Fox had taken against it. But again, as you quite rightly said in, in your introduction, the idea of using these wonderful, I mean, really wonderful cover versions. And I mean, they, 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 there were 30 of them originally. I think I used about 24 of them in the new film. 
They were so good. I mean, Leo Sayer, sensational. Mm. David Essex, sensational. Even the Bee Gees. And I mean, I love the Bee Gees dearly. But I mean, they are, again, absolutely wonderful. And I thought, we can't let this material just disappear. So we now had all this uh, wonderful, I mean, really wonderful cover versions, um, which I'm, I'm sure the Beatles approved of. Um, and then the, the basic idea of using Second World War material. But I thought, well, the subject is much richer than that. You know, we, mm-hmm. we can expand it. We can talk about all kinds of other things uh, and relate it to the, the present day. Right. And one of the nicest, before I stop, one of the nicest things that anybody said about the film, I mean, it's a completely new film. Um, I've read one or two uh, pieces where they say, oh, this is a revamp of the old film. It isn't a bit. I mean, the music's the same, but the, the whole thing is it's a completely new film. But one of the nicest things that somebody said, which I did take enormously to heart, was that this actually makes those great songs of the Beatles, Long and Winding Road, uh, Yesterday, Fool on the Hill, and so on and so on, it makes them relevant today. And I thought, wow, I mean, that that is the kind of accolade that I was, would hope for. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know whether McCartney's seen that, but um, uh, and unfortunately, uh, John Lennon is no longer available to see it. But I yeah. mean, I'm, I'm sure that if, if Paul did read that, his heart would leap too, you know, to oh, make yeah. the Beatles music relevant to today. So, okay, it's stuff from the Second World War, a lot of enormous number of footage, amount of footage that I had, that I'd mm-hmm. collected over the years. But somehow you think, yes, that's about now. This film is about now. It's a completely new film about now. So I'm, I'm going on. You tell me to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to make some comments on it, my own comments. You're, you'll love them. Yes, it's, sure. it's, a, it's, it's a different take. First of all, you've done a magnificent job on the quality of the video. The World War II newsreels and films are the best quality I've ever seen. You've done a great job with that. Now, the video, to me, would make a great teaching tool because... We all timeline ah. our lives to music. Why not do the right. same by, by learning history? You know, my, my son... My, that. Yeah. Go on. Sorry, sorry Ray. Uh, well, my, my son-in-law is a high school um, history teacher who's very excited about the video. I mean, you know, putting music with history and, and the way it's presented, yeah. I mean, you know, it's perfect. It, 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 it's well, every history teacher's dream, really. <laughs> we, well, we had one. That's very interesting because we had one big screening in England uh, a week and a bit ago. Um, and uh, I, I would think 50% of the audience, quite a big audience, came mm-hmm. up to me and said, this should be in every single school yes. in England. I mean, it was, school in England. it was shown in England, of course. But uh, in other words, the feeling was the same. This was in the nicest possible way, an educational tool exactly. as to what happened in the Second World War. But uh, I, I wouldn't want to say sugaring the pill, but, you know, using the music to demonstrate what happened. And I think another really important element in the film, which I, I hope you found as well, um, was to suddenly, I mean, my big hero at the end of the film is Roosevelt. Yep. I thought I really began to understand how important Roosevelt was mm-hmm. in the in the uh, organisation of the Second World War. Of course, we're English and we think, well, Churchill won the war. Now, Churchill made a very important contribution, but right. in fact, it was Roosevelt. It was his intelligence and his wisdom and his drive. And there are two wonderful moments in the film from Roosevelt's speeches. We've used quite a lot of Roosevelt's speeches, yes. where. Um, he's announcing to the Congress how much they're going to have to spend. And he doesn't ask them. He just says, the amount we're going to spend this year on the war, and he looks down at his notes, of course he knew what it said, then mm-hmm. looked back up and with a smile says, $50 billion. Yeah. And that was the end of discussion. Now, you can't <laughs> That's a lot of money for back then. President <laughs> saying that. It's a wonderful thing. And then a little while later on, my, again, my favorite, and again, you realize what an extraordinary man Roosevelt was. Another wonderful thing he said uh, is that after Mussolini, the dictator of Italy, had been yep. captured, um, he says, in, and these were all his fireside chats, but they were filmed. He says, uh, Mussolini came to the reluctant conclusion that the jig was up. <laughs> I like that. I remember that, that yeah. That's a wonderful thing for any great. politician, let alone the President <laughs> of the United States. So he emerged, you know, as a real extraordinary man. And, of course, Churchill is there, and, 
and Montgomery's there, and, and yeah, Montgomery, yeah. there, and the, yeah. the rest are all there. But it's Roosevelt who's the hero, and so as I'm, I'm delighted uh, that that's your that that's your um, son-in-law's reaction because that was the reaction in England. Should be in every school in definitely. England. As oh, definitely. This is what happened. You know, I, I watched the video with my dad, who is a World War II vet. He was in Japan, yeah. in Okinawa, in Saipan. He, he's in his 90s. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so glad he's still with us uh, today. But he, re he really loved the film as well. Great. Well, I mean, it pays tribute to their enormous, yep. enormous sacrifices that people made and the enormous courage um, that they exhibited on, on all fronts. But in a strange kind of way, the music... Um, makes it relevant. I, I said, as I said before, makes it relevant to today. Yep. You realize that, yes, that is 60, 70 years ago, but actually those people would have gone through exactly that today for the same cause. You know, it's not something that is, uh, it's, hist it's not ancient history. It's, it's history as, 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 as exemplified today. And of course, at the end, as you've seen, we bring it absolutely up to date with all the exactly. terrible going on in Syria yep. and all of that. And you suddenly yep. realize, my God, nothing has changed. Nothing's changed. And again, I mean, I, yep. I never thought I would be pro Douglas MacArthur. I mean, yeah. if you'd <laughs> ask me, I mean, I would have swallowed a whole bag of pills before I yeah. said I was pro Douglas. But actually, what MacArthur says at the end of the film, mm -hmm. you know, that the, the peace is now for keeps. And yeah. may God make it so. Right. And he says it with such eloquence and such, uh, such a belief that you think, yeah, of course that's true. And then you realize, that, of course, it isn't true. It's not his yeah. fault, but it wasn't true. It didn't of course, happen. There, and, there, and there was a disturbing scene, of course. I guess it was it was in Auschwitz with, with the uh, you know the Jews and, and all yeah, the bodies and, and you know burying the, the skeletons and things like that which yeah. you know kids today need to see because a, a lot of kids you know they're stuck on their uh, on their iPhones you know and, and and they're not they have every tool possible at their disposal now to look up history you know well I mean I, I, I hope I mean the intention that when I made this new film I mean the intention was not to kind of shove history down your throat but just to remind you of the sacrifices exactly. that people made and yep. also of the terrible cost there was. I'm not right. talking about money, but in terms of, you know, people being killed and, and, and so on and so on. And also the bravery, I mean, the courage. I mean, there, there are two sequences in the film, which, I mean, I, I, I can't believe I edited them as the way I did. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd want to say I'm really very proud of them, but I mean, th I, that would be arrogant. But, I mean, the attack on Pearl Harbor... Right. Um, to um, I am the walrus, I think is absolutely breathtaking, mm -hmm. um, and the and the uh, the kamikazes attacking the fleet, again. I mean that that's, I mean how the hell did those cameramen film that stuff? I mean <laughs> I know. they're right in the thick of it. I know. I've never seen the I mean, footage the like this before. You know, I really haven't. Now, and, and 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 the way it was presented, I've never seen anything like it ever. It, it was it well, was amazing. An amazing job. You know, I'm giving it five stars. I don't care what anybody else says. It's, 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 <laughs> well, that's, it's a, very, that's very sweet of you, because I really feel that you've absolutely understood what we were trying oh, yeah. to do. And, I, I mean, I, I, uh, uh, forgive me for going back to something I said earlier. I mean, I'm just getting a bit pissed off with, with um, it's not happened very much, but one or two people have said, oh, this is just a revamp of the old film. But no, not at seen, all. Not at well, all. Well, firstly, they haven't seen it, because it's that's not right. there to be seen. So yeah. what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> I hate, you know, I hate critics, you know. I if I have nothing good to say, I won't say it. <laughs> you yeah. know, what's the point? Well, it's it's their opinion, and I I respect that. But you know, yeah. they 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 clearly can't have looked at it. That that was what I felt anyway. Blah blah blah. You, you, you know, I, I chatted with a lot of legendary musicians who had uh, actually uh, very interesting World World Two experiences. You know, I've talked to John yeah. K. Steppenwolf, who's an Iron Curtain cool. survivor. John Mayall. I, I think yeah. he remembers well, as a kid the the, uh, the Blitz and and also yeah. Petula Clark, you know, of who course. was involved. Of course, so of that, course. That's, maybe that's another movie, you know. <laughs> yeah, it could be. I mean, it could be. I mean, I I I feel very strongly that, that as I said at the beginning, that the the performances that we get, again, I, I had absolutely nothing to do with that, and the the or the orchestrations um, that we get. Are with people, like, as I said, with people like David Essex and Leo Sayer and Rod yep. Stewart and so on and so on, are just wonderful. I mean, they are absolutely wonderful. It's, 
quite funny at the end, as you know, at the end of the film, mm-hmm. we go through who sang what so people don't um, right. get confused. And the pictures of them come up as they were in 1976. And the interesting thing is the only one, the only picture, uh, who, the only uh, picture of the person who looks exactly as he did in 1976, he looks exactly the same today, is Rod Stewart. He hasn't <laughs> changed a bit. Because, <laughs> I mean, some of them you, you'd have struggled to recognize, I think. David Essex you wouldn't recognize now. You know, I was surprised how many uh, artists did covers of the Beatles. I, I, did, I wasn't aware of a lot of the Leo Sears stuff at all. Yeah. And well, he did they, a great they, job. Those, those, co- those covers were done uh, especially for the soundtrack. I mean, they were, they were specially uh, uh, orchestrated and they were specially recorded. Um, I had nothing to do with that. That was my big inheritance. And it was that, in a funny kind of way, that got me going. Because I thought, you know, these are just too good to have disappeared. Exactly. I know they're on a CD, but, um, but they're just too good to, uh, to have disappeared. And in fact, as I think there were, there were yep. 30 tracks originally, and I think we used 24, mm-hmm. or at least part of 24, possibly 25. Well, it, it's oh, an awesome, awesome film. Yeah. I, I always said uh, a good editor and a good, you know, engineer that 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 makes that makes everything. If you don't have those two things, then you know, forget about it. You know. Well, it helps. It helps, and I yeah. think it's really. I thought it was really important when I began to think about what I could do uh, with the material um, was uh, to really literally start from scratch. I mean, I think the amount of um, archive footage that is in the, the new version of the film, mm-hmm. or the new film, I should say. It's not a version, yeah. the new film, compared with uh, what we took from the old film, is about 10%. I mean, we only used about 10% of the Second World War archive that had been in the original film in the new film. I mean, so 90% of the archive is stuff that I found that I thought was relevant, um, and some of it, uh, uh, well, I mean, it's probably not for me to say, but I mean, some of it is absolutely breathtaking. Breathtaking. You can't believe that there were cameramen filming this stuff. Uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and the, way you, the way you added the old films like uh, Rommel, you know, James Mason. Oh, yeah. Did, did you yeah. do that, or was that already in the film? Uh, uh, there was a bit of it in the film, but, I mean, as I'd worked a lot with Richard Burton, I felt it was really important to get him in somewhere, so I wanted to include that. <laughs> I was I was actually friends with James Mason, James and Clarissa Mason. They were customers oh, right. of mine, yeah, in D.C. So, oh, right. Yeah. He, yeah he was James a, Mason makes several appearances, once with a German accent and once right. without a James. <laughs> yeah, he, 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 was a, he, he was a great actor, great actor. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful actor, as was Richard, of course. Yeah. Yeah, you work with Richard in a couple of movies, correct? There's a couple of movies uh, well, that you Well, one big in. movie about Richard Wagner. Right. And... Um, I, I, I'm always asked, you know, what was it like to work with Richard Burton? I mean, it's a familiar question. And I say, well, it was fine, except for one thing. He was a bastard. Why was he a bastard? <laughs> he stole the best secretary I ever had, who was his <laughs> last wife. <laughs> his last wife was my secretary, Sally, and she was without doubt the best secretary I ever had. Bastard, he stole her from me. <laughs> what, was that during the filming, or was that before? Yeah, yeah it was during the filming. It was during the filming. <laughs> <laughs> you, you you did that movie, uh, uh, Wagner, and you also did In From the Coal, right, with Richard Burton? That's right. That That's a documentary. Well, after yeah. he died, uh, Sally was absolutely besieged by people wanting to do the, the, quote, official film about Richard Burton. And, of course, what she was worried about was, you know, that all they would say is, oh, that old Welsh drunk who threw his, life, threw his career away by going making all those bad Hollywood movies. And... Um, <laughs> She wanted to make sure that didn't happen, which is why right. we made the film we did. And, you know, I used to, used to say, any actor who can do Spy Who Came In From The Cold, Equus, right. uh, and so on and so on, he's a bad actor? He's a drunken <laughs> Welsh actor through his career? Come on! You know, this, this is one of the greatest screen actors of the second half of the 20th century. That's Shut right. up, you lot. I know. I don't know what people are thinking. I really don't. Well, there was a very funny uh, experience when we were doing In From the Cold, which I'll tell you very briefly. I wanted, sure. to, interview, I wanted to interview Mike Nichols, because mm-hmm. Mike Nichols had, had directed uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Right. And um, uh, so uh, Mike said that he was filming, I think it was called Working Girls, um, in the, on the Lower East Side, and would I come down to the set, and he'd find some time. 
so I said, fine. So I was very kind of him. So I, down I went, and he, he found some time, and we disappeared to an upstairs room. And um, the, the first assistant said to Mike, very pointedly in front of me, you've got 10 minutes. Well, 40 minutes later, <laughs> he, Mike Nichols and I were still talking about Richard Burton for the film, right. for my film. And suddenly I spied out of the, uh, my left eye, as it were, I thought the first assistant come up to, you know, to basically take Mike Nichols away, long outstayed his welcome. And obviously with a big film crew downstairs waiting to go. And so I, I stopped the conversation. I said to Mike, I've got more than enough. What you said is absolutely priceless. And thank you very, very much. I'm really very grateful. And we stood up and shook hands. And then Mike t uh, turned to this person who was behind me and said, um, oh, Harrison, do come and say hello to Tony Palmer. And it was Harrison Ford. So we spent another 20 minutes with Harrison Ford telling me how much he admired Richard Burton and what he admired <laughs> about Richard Burton. You know, great, great actors recognize each other. They, they do. know those special qualities. They do. You, you also yeah. did, uh, which I found very interesting, The World of Peter Sellers. Uh, I think I was back right. in 71. Now, why was that? Was that banned by the BBC? It was, it was originally banned. Well, it's still banned by the BBC. Well, what, I mean... I think what the BBC... Peter Sellers was then at the height of his fame. Right. And I knew him quite well even before I started to make the film. And I realized that he was, from a psychological point of view, an absolute mess. Um, you know, haunted by all kinds of demons. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, you know, as politely as I could to him, I, you know, I think making a film about you would be very interesting. And he looked at me and he said, um, you know, I'm not going to just do silly jokes and I said no no Peter come on that's not the kind of film I would want to make right. and um, so the kind of film I made was not what the BBC was expecting the BBC was expecting a film about a great comic right um, and I, I, I it's a name dropping story but I knew Stanley Kubrick and Stanley Kubrick had told me one funny story after another about filming Peter Sellers later on I mean not when I made the film but later on anyway so we started to make the film and one evening, Peter uh, rang me up and said, I I've been invited to a party. Will you come with me? And, uh, and I said, is it for the film? He said, no, nothing to do with the film. Um, I, just, I just need someone there with me. How, how do you feel? Uh, Peter, of course, I'll be right round. So round I went. And um, we walked, in fact, from his apartment, which was in Mayfair, to where this party was. And I said, I mean, I'm very flattered that you asked me. You could have asked a lot of other people. But mm -hmm. he said, well, actually... I thought, you're the one person who's going to get me through this particular party. And I said, well, what's the problem with it? He said, I know that when I arrive, somebody's going to come up to me and say, oh, you're uh, Peter um, uh, uh, Sellers. You know, do us one of those funny things. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, you've got to either hit the other person or take me firmly <laughs> by the hand. And go. So I said, come on, Peter, you don't, you don't need me to protect you. So we arrived <laughs> at the party. And we hadn't been there five minutes before somebody, some idiot, some Yahoo, <laughs> came up to me and said, oh, you're uh, uh, Peter, uh, but what's it? Do us one of those funny things. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> so I didn't hit him, but I dragged Peter away, and we went off yeah. and sat in the corner. But um, so, I mean, he was, he was, he was, he was, he felt he had no persona himself. Right. Right. Uh, he was all the characters that he had played and continued to play, of course, for the rest of his life and rest of his career. Mm -hmm. And he wanted a film that was about a, a non-person, if you like. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it was much richer and much more complicated than that. But the, B the BBC hated it because, and it was the reason I, I left the BBC, right. uh, that they hated it because, you know, it wasn't a film about a great comic. It yeah. was a film about someone who was in trouble. Uh, and who was very complex, and who, you know, was a great comic, but that was not what was interesting about him. Hmm. I, I, I thought, I, I think I, I, yeah, I thought it was very interesting to know about his his real side. You know, it's like, oh, absolutely. You know, and I yeah. mean, to some extent, I mean, all all the film. I, I I would not want to say I was inspired by that film, but I mean, it was a big lesson for me because I realised. Sure. That you know, when I you mentioned one or two of the other films that I've I've, I've made, like Maria Callas and, and mm -hmm. Margot Fontaine, you know, I realised it wasn't enough uh, to make just a film about, you know, you had to not dig the dirt up, but you had to try and understand these people. Right. Now the right. Maria Callas film, for example, is a perfect example of what I mean. 
you know, this is one of the greatest opera singers of the second half of the 20th century. Uh, but my film is not a film about an opera singer. Oh, and by the way, she's a, a woman with problems. My mm -hmm. film is a film about a woman with problems. Oh, right. and by the way, she's a great <laughs> opera singer, if you sure. see what I mean. Yeah. So it was really, uh, I mean, I've tried in, in those kind of profile films all the time to try and understand what it is that these people, um, not what they've given to us, we know that, but the mm -hmm. cost that they pay in order to give us what we right. appreciate. You know, people, so, I think you know, people... It, 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 it's tricky, it's tricky. Yeah. People identify, to me, I think they identify more with, with when they... You, they the, 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 re, the real selves, they come out and they, yeah, they show their, their, that they have problems and they're human just like everybody else, you know? Absolutely. And it's, yeah. it's not digging. I mean, I get, I, I get, you know, we were talking about critics earlier. I mean, I get fed up with critics saying, oh, he's just digging the dirt. I'm not digging the dirt. No, I'm trying to understand another human being. Right, now, this right. other human being happens to be very famous, a great dancer, a great singer, a great mm -hmm. whatever. Um, that's, of course, really important. But in the end... I think it actually enhances uh, and, and makes our understanding of these people richer. I mean, we, w once you know that Maria Callas, we keep talking about her, but once we know Maria Callas was, was a woman with horrendous personal problems yep. and yet was a great singer, when right. you now just listen to her voice, you think, fantastic, look what this woman achieved in exactly. spite of everything. And that's exactly. really important. It's like, it's like Robin Williams. Now that, now that we found out yeah. the other side of him, you know, yeah. how how could he be laughing and smiling and telling all those jokes when he had yeah, all course. those issues in his life, you know? Of course, interestingly enough, it, it was one of the subjects on my hit list. Oh, really? <laughs> I thought, well, um, <laughs> I really ought to have a go at Robin Williams, precisely I, that. And yeah. I, I, know, um, I know all the Monty Pythons very well, and I know... Yep. Um, uh, um, uh, um, Terry Gilliam, of course, and Terry Gilliam had worked with him. So I thought, and I discussed it with Terry Gilliam and said, well, there's only one way to find out. Just ask him. And um, But it was too late. Anyway. Well, if, you, if you ever do something again with music, uh, do do something on Jimmy Dore of Robin Trower and also do, uh, oh, really? um, because he, he was very, very underrated, you know, and there's yeah. you know, probably a lot, of good, a lot of good things I there. Agree. And there was somebody else I was going to mention. Well, I mean, the little, thing I did, the little thing I did with Hendrix, I mean, was, was yep. again fascinating. I mean, you, you couldn't not admire the way he played. But actually, when you, when you talk to him, you realize he was very shy, very diffident, um, right. very insecure, very exactly. uncertain about what he played. And I mean, that, that mixture of this fantastic performer on stage, who was also a bundle of nerves, yeah. um, and uh, no, that's that that well, that came out in the little thing I did with him. But I mean, it was it, it's the same sort of thing, really. You know, the real the real people. They're not. They're not. They're not. I, I did a film once about uh, Bobby Moore, who was the English yeah. captain. I was going to mention English that. Yeah, that was world. great. That was wonderful, by the way. Well, that that film. In, we interviewed all. Uh, I mean, it was made a few years ago, but we interviewed all the members of the World Cup team. Right. Um, who was obviously Bobby Moore was no longer alive, but we interviewed yeah. all the others. And Jack Charlton, who was this kind of m monstrous, um, well, centre half, they were called then, you know, really held the team together. Uh, I went to talk to him um, in, in Newcastle, and we were just chatting away about this, that, and the other. And he suddenly stopped, and in the, mid in the middle of a sentence, he looked out the window. And then he turned slowly back to me and he said, the thing about Bobby Moore, he said, was he was one of us, obviously, yep. a member of the team, yeah. but he wasn't like us. And I thought that's a perfect description of genius. He was mm -hmm. one of us, you know, did all the things that you and I do, but he wasn't like us. Right. There was right. something different about him. Yeah. That, of course, is, is a perfect description of great artists. They yeah. are like us, you know, they... They fart, they go to the lavatory, they eat, um, they have sex, but they're not like us. Yeah, there, there's something something special about them that we don't have, <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, I mean, they, 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 they go and we have to follow. I mean, they're, yeah. they're out yeah. on their own charting new territory, and that's what's exactly. really extraordinary about them. And that takes courage, of course. It does. Bobby Moore's story had Michael Caine, right, and David Beckham was in that. Yeah, that's and, right. That's absolutely yeah. right. And they had a, it was that's a TV movie right. back in 2002, and that's it was of brilliant. course a, well done. Yeah, yeah, it was about uh, an English professional uh, footballer 
And it was a team that won the 66 World Cup in pre-England. That's correct. Uh, That's and he correct. was part of yeah. that, yeah. No, that, that, was, was, Eddie, that Eddie, was a fascinating journey, but I mean, I, yeah. again, I learned a huge amount about about Bobby Moore. I mean, yeah. not just Jack Charlton's description, but I mean, again, about all the problems. I mean, when he held the world—that's it. It's also about courage. When he held the World Cup in his hand, mm. the famous iconic photographs. What nobody knew except two people: Alf Ramsey, the manager, and mm. his then wife Tina. What nobody knew was that he'd been diagnosed with cancer and yeah. told not to play. Right. But he ignored them and went mm. straight on. And when we, made, when we made the film, I knew that, uh, when we made the film, mm -hmm. and Alan Ball, uh, another wonderful player who since died, sadly, I said to Alan Ball, you, you must have known, surely you must have known. And he said, well, you know, when we were in the bath, you know, the collective bath, we could see these marks on his back. Right. And somebody said, you know, those are chemotherapy marks. And then somebody else said, no, don't be silly. Of course they're not. So we suspected, but we didn't know. And if Bobby didn't want to tell us, we, didn't, we weren't going to ask him. But the fact is, he'd been, he'd been diagnosed with cancer, told not to play. Mm -hmm. And uh, he consulted Alf Ramsey. And apparently Alf Ramsey said, it's up to you. And Tina said, she'd actually, Tina told me that um, first wife had, had told me that she'd said that he'd, she'd prefer that he didn't play. Yeah, Bobby says, "Hell with that! I'm the captain. Of course, I'm going to play." Right. Again, an amazing story, you know. That's amazing. amazing. Yeah, it's an amazing story. It really is. The the, uh, the guy I was thinking about uh, you, to do a story on Keith Emerson, because you know, of course, there's. Oh right, oh Keith Emerson, yeah, Emerson. We just Palmer. lost. Yeah, we just no lost relation. from suicide. So. Uh, really? Yeah. Yes. Uh. I I interviewed Keith. He he was a very nice guy. We talked for. Yeah, like an hour was. and a half. Yeah, and he and he, yeah, he he killed himself. Unfortunately, <sighs> his hand God, was not working properly to play the keyboards, and they think yeah. that's one of the reasons why he, he did himself in. There so sad. Yeah. Yeah. I, now here's here's the legend. <clears throat> Tony Palmer was studying moral sciences at Cambridge University in the sixties, right? That's right. And, and you got a call to attend a press conference for the Beatles. That's correct. Okay. <clears throat> they, they they just had a number one single, uh, single, and you didn't ask any questions to John Lennon. And That's John, correct. And John Lennon <laughs> asked you, why didn't you ask me any questions? And then you told him about your background and uh, you know, what you're studying at Cambridge, and you got so interested that you took him for a tour of the college. And he, was, yeah, he, he wore, asked a, he me wore a beard. Him round, and I, I first <laughs> said no, but he said, why not? And I said, well, you'll be mobbed, and that's not my idea of fun. So he said, I'll come in disguise. How about if I come in disguise? <laughs> he turned up in a brown, he turned up in a very silly beard and a brown Macintosh and a very big fedora hat. And we both got the giggles. And so he took them off. And he was very happy. And then at the end of that afternoon, he said, um, he scribbled a, a, a telephone number on a bit of paper and said, you know, after the concert tonight, uh, we get taken away very quickly and I won't have a chance to, to see you again. But he said, you know, call me when you come to London. Well, I, I said, I'm not coming to London. I'm staying here. I'm, I, I have a chance of being an academic. He said, well, you know, call me. So um, I did eventually go to London to work at the BBC. And I still had this bit of paper. But by that time, of course, the Beatles were intergalactically famous. Right. So I thought, he's never going to, he's never going to. But I, I thought nothing ventured, nothing gained. So I dialed the number. And uh, you could tell from the girl's voice on the other end that I was the 400th person that morning <laughs> who'd run up to say, John Lennon said to call. And I said, well, he really did say to call. And she said, well, all right, all right, all right she said. So I, I put the phone down and I thought, I'm never going to hear another word. But 30 minutes later, a man called Derek Taylor, who was their PR man, uh, their main PR man, right? Oh, yeah, Derek back. Taylor, sure. Derek Taylor, and who, yeah. who subsequently he and I became very, very good friends, mm -hmm. rang me back and said, uh, I've got a message for you from John. And, of course, I was racing through my head, what, what, who the hell are you? What the hell do you want? Uh, you know, F off, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> so I was very nervous, and, and I said, well, what's the message? He said, why has it taken you two and a half years to ring up? He'd remembered. <laughs> so then we had, we had met for lunch again very soon. A lot of brown rice, uh, <laughs> his favorite lunch. And a lot of things flowed from that, in fact.
Yeah, he he gave you some um, uh, of his contacts, right, in the music industry, and that kind of well, helped him uh, for he, making. I them? mean, it's almost impossible to to, to realize that then. Yeah. I mean, we're talking right. we're talking end uh, end of sixty six, beginning of sixty seven. Right. That then nobody took, if I can call it pop music. I mean, by that, of course, I mean rock and roll and everything else, popular music, seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, because they just thought, oh well, it's you know, it's all that trivial, awful stuff. And there were a lot of, and John over the brown rice said, you know, there are a lot of great musicians mm-hmm. who simply either can't get onto the BBC or right. won't appear on the BBC. You remember the the Dave Clark show, I'm sure. Sure. A lot of gyrating nubiles, mm-hmm. and um, not, I'm not against gyrating nubiles, but you know, you don't want, the, the, as it were, somebody like Jimi Hendrix appearing in the distance beyond the gyrating new post. Exactly. It's insulting. It's insulting to them as musicians. Right. So John gave me this list and said, you know, so you're, you, you should make a film with these people um, demonstrating what phenomenal musicians they are, but also mm-hmm. what they stand for. Yep. And I said, fine. Well, I mean, w- one or two of them I knew. I mean, oddly enough, one of the people on the list was Pink Floyd, and I'd been at school with Roger Waters, so I mean, I, I did have a contact there. Most of mm-hmm. them I didn't know at all, except by reputation. So John said, uh, I'll make the contacts, I'll tell them they've got to do it, you make the film. So I said, fine. Um, and so we made a film called All My Loving. John gave me the title again. Um, so, and that, I mean, I'm, I'm quoting what other people say now. Uh, this is not me, me being boastful. But, I mean, it absolutely overnight changed what people thought pop music was like and what it was capable of and what its, its role was and how important it was. I mean, it literally changed overnight uh, because of that film. John and I had a bet, actually, interestingly enough, where um, uh, I, we were talking about he'd seen the film. And we were talking about what, what the likely reaction was. And I said, well, my, you know, my guess is that the popular papers, they'll absolutely love it. And the, the quality papers, they'll, they'll hate it. They'll just think it's just pretentious bullshit. And he looked at me and he said, you're quite wrong. It'll be the other way around. Mm-hmm. And I said, come on. He said, I'll bet you five pounds, which was a lot of money in those days, right. um, that this would be the case. So, you know, the reviews came out. He was absolutely right. The popular papers lo- loathed it. Mm. They thought it was pretentious gobbledygook. But the quality papers wrote reams, I mean, page after page after page. I have to add on, I never got my five pounds from Mr. Lennon. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, But, I mean, well, he, was, he was spot on. I mean, because that's what yeah. it did. You know, people suddenly realized, I don't, not entirely because of me, but um, partly because of this film, um, that you know that the rock and roll popular music had, had was had two things. It had musicians of phenomenal ability. Right. You know right. when you think that this was Cream's first appearance on yep. on any television. Yep. You know and you think of Clapton and and uh, uh, Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker. Phenomenal. Hendrix the same. Pete right. Floyd same. These are, these were the great extraordinary um, guitarists, drummers, whatever. Extraordinary musicians. That was well, the first thing that the film made absolutely plain. And the second thing was that they weren't kind of completely incoherent, mumbling drug addicts. They, had, right, they were very exactly. articulate. They had a lot of things yeah. to say. Yeah. Now, of course, today, we, we wouldn't think twice about that. Mm-hmm. But in the, when that film was first shown in 68, that was an absolute seismic shock mm-hmm. that these people could actually speak in coherent, joined-up sentences. That was unbelievable. Yeah. Well, John Lennon called the film a, a monumental achievement and thanked you for creating the series. Bing Crosby held its editing and deemed it a priceless archive. Pete Seeger yeah. said that its colossal, emotional, intellectual, and history range is breathtaking. And, yeah. and, and that there was a five-disc DVD of the series that was released May of 2008. That's right. The series came a bit later than the first film, but I mean, they're, right. they're, they're, they're connected. I mean, they're absolutely connected. Now, they, they well, said I wrote to Pete. I actually wrote after Pete Seeger said that. He wrote that to me in a letter. I wrote back to say, I said, Pete, I love you dearly, but you're getting a bit carried away. <laughs> he wrote back. He just crossed that. My reply, he crossed it out and wrote over it, bullshit. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you uh, included all the genres. 
I mean, you had folk, ragtime, Tin Pan Alley, yeah. Wildville, Music Hall, that Musical Theater. The series, I mean, right. everything that was there. The Country, series. swing, jazz, blues, R&B, and, of course, rock and roll. Uh, yeah. did, did, you intentionally, ragtime, ragtime. Did, did you intentionally leave out disco and punk, or was that just maybe the time? Well, no. I mean, uh, well, the punk, punk was a bit of a disaster. I mean, the... the um, I finished the finished the editing around about the b- end of 1975, beginning of 76. Right. Which, of course, punk was just starting. Just starting, and right? I went back and I begged the distributor to give me more money to do um, uh, an, a, a, another episode, episode 18, as it turned out to be, mm-hmm. uh, about punk. And I mean, the guys who'd, who'd given me the money, they were archetypical, very nice Jewish. Um, mainstream entertainment professionals. Right. You know, the idea of them messing with something called punk. I mean, remember, punk was turned down by EMI for yeah. the same sort of reason and, right. and taken up by Richard Branson. Um, but it was, it was I, I begged them for, for more money, but they simply wouldn't. Uh, the, and, of course, at that point, the, they hadn't sold the series, um, and, you know, they weren't sure that they'd get their investment back. I mean, they got their investment back, and how? Yeah. Um, but that was the problem. I mean, if I'd been dealing with, if Richard Branson had, had, um, had paid for the whole thing, I right. mean, he'd have ordered me to do punk, but he, he didn't. But these were very nice um, three brothers uh, called Delphon mm. and the Grades. I mean, the famous Grade family. Um, um, but they, they were Jewish immigrants at the turn of the 20th century who'd made good. And they were all members of the House of Lords. Hmm. And they were the ultimate respectable Jewish mainstream businessmen who right. put on the royal show at the London Palladium. So the idea of them doing punk was, I think, <laughs> a bridge too far, really. <laughs> so that was all. It was it was bad timing, but or unfortunate timing, not bad timing. All you need is love. It, it, it's a it was a seventeen part television documentary series, right? It was yes. That was that was not yeah. the original film. The original film was all my loving, but it, it, all, right. all you need is love flowed from that. Very very funny story about the title. I mean, John again said, you know, mm-hmm. use the title. I'll give you a perfect title. Call it all you need is love. I said, oh, wait a second. I think I know that title from somewhere. Isn't there a song about that? <laughs> he laughed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, when that uh, DVD box set came out to which you referred, um, he said uh, that the American distributor said, you've got to do a title check, you know, a title search, right. to prove that you're allowed to use that title. Right. And I, I, I protested and said, well, that's ridiculous because, you know, it's common parlance now, all you need. No, no, we insist. So we found two interesting things. Firstly, the Beatles themselves had never trademarked or copyrighted the title. So it was really? that sense it was free. No, nope, never interesting. Did. Yeah. But two people had, and they were the problem or they looked as if they might be the problem. The first was a brothel in Amsterdam, which had copyrighted the title. And the second one that was a manufacturer of risque lingerie in Hong Kong. Oh, <laughs> so eventually I went back to the American distributor and I said, come on, you don't seriously think they're going to complain if we use the title. I don't think they were happy about it, but they reluctantly agreed. Jeez. <laughs> Who would ever thought that, you know? <laughs> Never yeah, in a million fine. years. <laughs> what, what was John like? You know, I've, I've talked to a lot of people that knew him. I've, I've interviewed Julian. Um, oh, right. Yeah. What, what, what was, I mean, did he have that uh, kind of sarcasm going most of the time? Well, or? I mean, he, really... uh, he, I mean he, the, uh, to state the obvious, he was right. very, very bright, very intelligent. Yep. And I think he was slightly dismissive. Mm-hmm. And don't forget, he came out of the tradition where they were used to being interviewed by people who'd come up and ask about their sex life or about the new number one and uh, you know what was going on in the, in the whatever. They weren't. They they didn't come from a tradition, um, and this was not only common at the Beatles, but common with a lot of people. They mm-hmm. didn't come from a tradition where people were prepared to treat them. Uh, with respect, both as people and as musicians. Right. And I, I funny, funny enough, I think that was my way into them. That I mean, I'd, I didn't care about all the other stuff. You know, what I did care about was about them as musicians, great composers, and also mm-hmm. as people. Sure. So I think I got on uh, on that level. I got on extremely well with him because you know there, there was he was not very good at small talk because small talk was what he'd been brought up on. If you see mm-hmm. what I mean. 
Right. Uh, but he was interested in, you know, having serious discussions about this, that, and the other. And I think with me, he found he could have those serious discussions, uh, and that I wasn't going to write them down and sort of do a, um, a tell-all for the Daily Mirror later, if you see what I mean. Sure. Um, and that, uh, I mean, interestingly enough, I've got quite a number of, of letters from him, um, or postcards and other things, um, which, I mean, I've repeatedly refused ever to part with, mm -hmm. because they were private between sure. him and me. So, you know, although he died, what, 36 years ago now, yeah. uh, you know, I, I still respect the trust he had in me, and, and I think it was mutual trust. And I think he, I think, to, so to that extent, he and I got, got on pretty well, I think. I, I think, you know, I do the same thing when I do interviews. Uh, you know, I've, I've probably done about 500 interviews in the last three, four years, I guess. It, it's, it's amazing, you know. But they, they, you know, when you talk, talk to them, not asking the same stupid questions that everybody else does, and you dig deeper, you know, and, and like you said, you find the human side. Yeah, it, it, and they, they have just, a lot just, to say. They have a lot to say. Exactly right. They have a lot to say, and they have a lot to say about the world in which we live. Exactly. And, and that that takes us back to the, the the new film. I mean, that was what I felt really yep. important to to make clear in the new film that this is about us and the world that we have made, the world in which we live today. Um, and of course, I can do that by using the archive. But also, I felt that the music was doing it for me. You know, I wasn't trying to force the music into some mm -hmm. kind of historical straitjacket. Um, I was really trying to let the music live and breathe and, and really demonstrate uh, to an audience that thinks they vaguely know the songs. But actually, those songs are really important. They're part of our culture and they're part of the way we are. Yes. I, I, you know, I've never thought about the fool on the hill being Hitler it, until no. this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, there you go. I mean, it, 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 it fits perfectly. It fits perfectly. <laughs> and the long and winding road, you know, as they're tramping yep. through the Philippines and and so on. And Maxwell Silver Hammer during the. Uh, yeah, Maxwell Silver Hammer, yeah. yeah. I mean, who would have believed? <laughs> it's Frankie Valley, isn't it? Who would have thought? <laughs> Come Never. On. But again, Never. I think that works very well. It was it was a great and in the version of because I've never heard before it, as well the, the artist that the sang because. Sorry, I missed that. Yes. That was great. That was wonderful. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah. Who were some of the musicians or actors um, that, you know, inspired you at an early age? Um, well, well among, I mean, among the rock and rollers, if you see what I mean. I mean, undoubtedly the Beatles. I mean, I, 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 I think I twigged very early on. Mm -hmm. that, uh, I mean, I'm not excluding Ringo and George, but Lennon and McCartney was something special. There was right. something really interesting musically. I'm not a musician. But there was something really interesting musically going along here. Uh, I remember trying to beat to um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, is, it, uh, is it paperback writer? There's one where you mm -hmm. try to beat four in the bar and you constantly get lost yeah. uh, because it isn't four in the bar. It's a very, it's quite a complicated time signature. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I, I I think I tweaked very early on. Um, I was through oddly enough. Um, uh, Jimmy Page. Jimmy Page was the first real contact I had with uh, rock and rollers. And in fact, I mean, I went on, on tour with um, uh, Zeppelin um, and wrote a big, big piece about, famous piece about them, uh, which, I, again, I found absolutely uh, extraordinary. I mean, it's extraordinary musicians yeah. and extraordinary people and the very antithesis of what their image was. That's what mm -hmm. I found gripping. Mm -hmm. um, but through Jimmy, I met all kinds of other people like Eric Clapton. And I mean, I remember going, I think it's not the first ever Cream gig. Mm -hmm. It was in the Dome in, in um, Brighton, a, a town on the south coast of England, as you know. Um, and I was just completely bowled over. And I thought, these guys, I mean, these, uh, the, they weren't up to full speed on their improvisations, but they were, they were pr improvising pretty amazingly. And of course, I, did, I filmed a Cream Farewell concert. And one of the amazing things, and I, I'd been to many, many concerts by the time I filmed that, but one of the amazing things it seemed to me was that, of course, of course there were antagonisms between the three of them. Um, nowhere near as bad as, as we are often led to believe, but there were antagonisms. Sure. But they were mostly musical antagonisms. I mean, yeah. they used to get bored playing the same old bit. So Jack, right. for example, 
would right. invert the bass line mm-hmm. to see if the other two noticed. And of course, the other two noticed <laughs> immediately. And, and you know, they, they, were, they were sufficiently good musicians, they could deal with it. Ginger was the worst. I mean, Ginger would deliberately <laughs> change the time signature. Yeah. I mean, we're going along four in a bar, it would suddenly become five in a bar, then three in a bar, <laughs> then four in a bar, then two in a bar, then seven in a bar. He'd do it constantly uh, just to see if the other two were awake, if you see what I mean. <laughs> and of course they were, and of course they could deal with it, and that's why they were such wonderful, one of yeah. the reasons they were such wonderful musicians. But it, that was the cause of the antagonism between the three of them. They were trying to outplay the other two, but of course the other two, were, they were e- all equally great. So they couldn't be outplayed. But I think my, after my initial uh, realization of how, Im- how important, musically speaking, uh, Lennon and McCartney were, I mean, it was, it was Cream that finally made me realize that mm. you, these were great, great musicians, as well as being extraordinary people. And of course, from then on, it was Hendrix and then Zeppelin. Mm-hmm. I, I had a blast interviewing Jack Bruce. Uh, it was the year he passed away. We were promoting yeah. his, last, his last album. Funny guy, and you know he. he you know, we were talking about Ginger Baker, how he he just didn't have a sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing he didn't like, thing he didn't like about Ginger, or what you know, what Ginger didn't like about Jack was that Jack always turned the volume up um, on on his bass. Uh-huh. And Ginger, they had a fight about it. I mean, I think fifty cups, and and uh, Ginger said, um, you know, why do you always do this? And then, and then Jack said, Cause so I don't have to listen to you. And then Ginger <laughs> said, that's because you're fucking dead. <laughs> and on it went from there. That's but, funny. I mean, there was enormous love between them. I mean, there really yeah. was. I mean, great, great uh, admiration, mutual admiration. T- Tony, I mean, what's when next? They split up, I, mean, I remember the reason they split up wasn't because they were, you know, they were fed up and exhausted. They were exhausted. They were knackered. Yeah, I mean, yeah. In, I think in two and a half years, this is well documented um, mm-hmm. by ha- Michael Harry Shapiro. They did something like two hundred and eighty gigs. Yeah, two hundred and eighty gigs all over the world yeah. in two and a half years. That's a phenomenal number. I think a lot of those they guys were burnt out. Absolutely knackered. In yeah. fact, in the uh, Cream Farewell that evening in the Albert Hall, I, mm-hmm. I said to Eric, "Why didn't she just take six months off?" You know, go sit on a desert island or something and recover your stamina and your strength and and then get back together again. But they didn't want to. I think they, they'd had enough. Also, they were having very bad time with um, Robert Stigwood. Right, right. Which is a big story, as I'm sure you know. Uh, when um, John Mayall turned 80 years old, he celebrated here in Saras- I'm in Sarasota, Florida. So yeah, yeah. I, I covered the show. I hung out backstage with him, just me and John. Uh, you know, he actually sets up his own equipment. You know, the guy's 80-some years old now. Yeah. He's still touring like crazy. Uh, yeah. He promotes his music after, you know, during that, before and after the show, signing autographs. And just an yeah. amazing, amazing guy. Yeah. For, you know. No, he is very, very extraordinary, John Mayer. Yeah. I quite agree. And, 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 you know, well, there we are. Yep. He's definitely the godfather of the blues. <laughs> oh, definitely. Oh, undoubtedly. And they would all say so. They would all They would all uh, go along with that, I'm yeah. sure. Tony, what's next on the horizon for you uh, after this uh, wonderful project that, that you've done? That, you know, Thank we'll, you. We'll... Uh, well, I'm actually writing a book. Oh, great. I've written uh, a fair number of books already, but yes, you uh, have. never quite about rock, and ro- uh, about rock and roll. This is not about rock and roll. Okay. This is uh, if I say it's it's my memoirs. That's that's not quite true. But I'll give me right. a clue. It's just about why. It's really about why these people do what they do, mm-hmm. and the cost that they pay, and the extent to which we, um, as as I said, the extent to which we admire what they do without really understanding what they have to go through in order to give us the magic that they do. Yeah. So I thought, well, mm-hmm. I've I've dealt with quite a number of of folks of that ilk, so I'll try and pull it together and and um, put it uh, in some coherent form. What, when will that be done? Writing. What? When will that be finished? <clears throat> um, well, well, if you listen to the publisher, um, uh, <laughs> he's, of course he'll he'll deliver it by Christmas time. <laughs> of course. <laughs> 
No, I, I have started. Um, um, uh, I, I know that I would, my wife would divorce me if I don't do it. She's been banging on at me for, well, for quite a long time right. to p- put it down because uh, I have three uh, very interested but smallish children, 14, 13, and nearly 11. Oh, wow. And I don't think they have a clue about what, what I've done in my uh, life now that I'm yeah. a geriatric. So my wife's view is that, you know, you have a responsibility to write it all down, so at least they'll have a vague idea who you are and what you did. <laughs> I said, well, good luck. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's unfortunate. You know, my, my daughter's also a teacher. Uh, she's an English teacher, and uh, she's really into music, and she was brought up with my music, of course. You know, I, you know, I was brought up uh, in the 60s music. Of course, I love progressive rock. I'm a big prog yeah. rocker, you know, Pink Floyd, Tall, Yes, yeah. Everest Lake and Palmer, that kind of thing. But she's very disappointed with the, like, her classes that don't know anything about even her generation. Yeah. And she's 30, yeah. no, no, 31 years it's old. The <laughs> it's the case. I mean, it, yeah. it, it is horrifying, the extent to which... Well, that, that, that again, takes us back to the, the Beatles in World War Two. I mean, I... I didn't intend it as a history lesson, but I can quite see that it is in a strange kind of way. Because the music they vaguely heard of, right. you know, uh, kids today, teenagers today, um, sounds very patronizing. I don't wish it to sound to be patronizing. But they really don't have a clue as to what actually happened in, in the Second World War. And if, if this agree. is a way that they, they can come to some understanding of what happened and some understanding of how relevant it is to today then I think job well done. Yep, and it should be in every history class across the world. I, I recommend it. I hear it. what I, you say, recommend it highly. I will speak to the distributor. Okay, great. If I can help in any way, just let me know. <laughs> That's very, very kind of you. <laughs> Tony, thank you so much for being on the show well, today. Well, it's been terrific fun. I'm sorry you had problems finding, uh, getting the, the right bit of the mountain to track me down on, but the, we did the, it eventually. The, the main thing is we connected, and you're on a mountain in Switzerland, so it's I amazing. indeed. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate it. Well, it's wonderful and, to talk to you. Thank you very, very much, and thank you, you for your time. You're very welcome. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Uh, bye-bye now. Purchase the Beatles in World War II, the best collection of Beatles covers in a film ever, at www.gonzomultimedia.com or amazon.com. Visit Tony Palmer's official website at www.tonypalmer.org. Coming up next on the Ray Shasho Show, guitarist Doug Aldrich of the Dead Daisies. Very special thanks to the great Billy James of Glass Onion PR for arranging this interview, and to the amazing Doug and Don Newsom with BBS Radio for making it all happen every show. Please join me by weekly Mondays at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern on the Ray Shasho Show. If you have comments or suggestions or would like to be a guest on the Ray Shasho Show, call 941-877-1552 or email us at ray at publicityworksagency.com. And don't forget to purchase a copy of my book entitled Check the G's, The True Story of an Eclectic American Family and Their Wacky Family Business, or the second edition entitled Wacky Shenanigans on F Street, proud to be politically incorrect in Washington, D.C., available now at Amazon.com. You'll live it. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Ray Shasho Show, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call 941-877-1552 or visit us at publicityworksagency.com. Specializing in author and music artist publicity plans. We shine when we make you shine. Join Ray Shasho every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern on BBS Radio, Station 1.